Hey folks, today the first part about my do-it-yourself concrete milling machine here. I have already teasered it in the last video and as you can see it quite something has happened here because it already looks quite nice here. The linear guides are mounted and looks like it's ready for the XY axis and the Z axis. It looks good but there is a big big problem here. I will tell you that in the second part of the video. But in the first part of the video I will cover the, the making of these parts a little bit. Unfortunately I didn't have my good camera on hand on most of the parts I made here. The starting point of this whole project was the uh, project of a friend, Sebastian Ent here on YouTube, also Ent CNC. Uh, he built a very similar machine and made the uh, cut files open source. So that was the uh, base. I designed uh, this milling machine here. I just made it a little bit bigger, especially more Z travel and Y travel. And here I have 390 millimeters in Z. Uh, 310 millimeters in Y and in X, the X axis has 450 millimeters. And when the spindle is in the most upper position, I have 450 millimeters to the table. So I cannot really reach the table with the spindle, but uh, I can put a long uh, tool holder in the spindle if I really need to reach down to the table for some reason. But with that, I have more space. Uh, above the vice, so I hope I won't run out of set travel so easily because that's the main reason I wanted this new machine that uh, I do not have enough set travel on my current machine. With the vice, I only can have left something like 50 60 millimeters of set travel, and that's really not much. Yeah, after I've uh, modified the uh, cut files a little bit. I prepared the steel inlays here and made the mold for these parts. I bought the stock already cut to length so I pretty much only had to drill and tap a lot of holes for the anchor screws that are in the concrete now. And yeah that took way more time than I planned for it. I think I, I planned something like one and a half or maybe two days and in the end it took more like three and a half days and not eight hour days more like 14 hour days um, yeah that was a little bit bad scheduled because i already had reservated the concrete mixer for the particular day where i wanted to make those parts and yeah uh, the mold was pretty much only just some wood plates I uh, got from the hardware store already cut to size so I had to screw them together and the uh, form was pretty much finished. And uh, actually let's say casting process was really not anything special. I just put in every part from the recipe from the manufacturer and the concrete mixer then wait about uh, five to ten minutes and you really have to wait that long for mixing because in the beginning it looks like you have way not enough water in the in the mixture but then after five minutes it really flows together and you have a nice nice uh, concrete mass it's an interesting material it's like it's flowing around but if you try to move it fast it breaks and you don't really get dirty hands when you grab it. It's like when you drop something on the ground you can just uh, take it with your hand put it back in the, uh, in, the, in the mold or something like that but you have to be fast because otherwise it will flow through your hand. <laughs> it's pretty funny and yeah then it was just put enough concrete in the form and uh, wait. <laughs> I also packed them into a plastic foil to prevent drying out. Uh, I let them in there for 
I think five days and then I removed the side plates from the form and let the, the concrete rest for two or three more days so it can gain some strength because I had to pull on the uh, metal inserts here and I really don't want to pull out uh, any of the inlays here because then the, the part would have been scrap but everything worked because I had to turn it around and yeah then uh, I had to wait about four to five weeks because uh, the concrete is shrinking a little bit yeah then it was already time to surface the the surfaces from the, the steel inlays and drill all the holes here and made an uh, edge where I can put the linear guides against so they are straightened out. Um, yeah, there everything looked fine while milling, everything worked fine and uh, the program worked, the clamping worked, uh, especially the, the base part here was very easy because we just used these uh, the holes here matched up with the slots in the table of the milling machine and also the the column was not so easy to clamp but I think we made it quite securely to clamp it because also when we tilted it up to mill the, the mating faces here that it don't drop down <laughs> from the table that would have been a disaster. And the next big step was bringing the parts down in the basement here Luckily I have a stair outside of the house which is pretty much just a concrete stair so very robust and I don't have to take care of scratching something or like that. And I screwed on some wood pieces on the parts where I can slide them on and then I just used a chain lift to guide them down the stairs. And first I thought it would have been really necessary to prevent them from slipping too fast but in the end the problem was that the parts didn't want to slip. I really had to push them down the stairs and the chain lift was pretty much only for safety. When they were down the, the stairs and halfway into the workshop it was an easy task because I then could use the engine hoist and bring them in and here on the, the place where they will stay in the future. Uh, the base frame uh, nice friend helped me out with that because I only have a tick welding machine and it would have been quite a pain to weld uh, this uh, massive structure with a tick. So he helped me out with his welding machine and we got this thing made in half a day so I'm pretty happy about that. It turned out really good and very solid. I'm really happy with that. It's pretty much just uh, 100 by 100 tubing with 5 mm wall thickness and a lot of that. The base frame weighs around 160 kilograms and is only I think 40 centimeters high so that's quite heavy for the height it has to, to lift up the parts here and they're standing very solid. So I hope I can use high acceleration and high speeds here in the future. I surfaced these surfaces here where the concrete parts are sitting on on my building machine but before welding because I cannot fit the whole thing on my milling machine it's more like the other way around I could fit the milling machine on the stand here <laughs> and so I had to, to shim those uh, quite a lot but uh, with the surfaced uh, surface here I, it was easy to shim because I had a defined surface to shim and not something like bold and whatsoever. Yeah that's pretty much the, the status this thing is in at the moment and now there's the big butt. It looks really nice, I like it, but it's not accurate. I really don't want to make any compromises here because it's hopefully the last or may, maybe I don't want to say the last milling machine I built but I don't want to make the errors I made with the earlier ones like say ah, I think that's okay or that's accurate enough or yeah that led to some problems with the early machines I had so I really have to redo the the surfaces here for the linear guides. 
I'm not sure how I will do that because yeah, they are already down in the basement here, the parts. And I'm not sure if I want to get them out again. So I have basically three options here. First, getting them out again and getting them to someone who can mill the surfaces. Uh, second, also getting them out again. And now a new option I didn't have before, surface grinding the surfaces. Because now all the, the features like the holes and the heights are pretty much already good. And so it would just be a, a skin pass with the surface grinder, which is quite attractive. And the third option would be scraping. Scraping has the advantage that I don't have to bring out the parts again. But I don't have any experience in scraping. I have watched some videos, so theoretically I know how it works. But I really have to get some practice before I can do that here. And also the surfaces are quite big, so it will take quite some time. I don't really have all the measuring tools I need for that job. So that sounds like investing a lot of money in measuring tools and investing a whole lot of time, which especially time, I don't have that much left at the moment. So I'm searching for someone who can uh, redo the surfaces here. And there until now, I wasn't really lucky. I sent out five emails. Uh, from three, I got no reply. Maybe I will get a reply tomorrow or something like that, but it's already, I think, two days uh, ago I sent the email. So, meh. And from the other two, I got a reply, but they don't want to do it because maybe they cannot do it or they just don't want to do it because it's not an attractive thing to do it. And yeah, basically, I haven't found a single one who would do that and I will try to find someone in the near region so I don't have to drive 400 kilometers to get the parts done here and yeah maybe I will be successful otherwise I'm not sure what to do well, I think that's pretty much all I can tell you now here about this uh, disaster <laughs> And I want to show you what the, the problem is here now shortly. Just a little measurement where you can see what, what happens. And I think the, the reason for the problem here is the milling machine I made or we made the part on. Because both parts have the same problem in the exactly same position and the same error. Uh, for, for both parts and the, this uh, the position where the error is is the same position in the big milling machine and yeah that's very unlikely to warp both parts exactly the same amount and in the same direction and so on to get the exactly same deviation on both parts yeah. but enough of the talking let's do a little measurement okay let's measure the problem here. I have mounted the magnetic base here on one side and the dial indicator indicates on the other side here. This dial indicator has a resolution of 2 micrometers per division. So one full rotation of the needle is 0.2 millimeters. And yeah, let's try to move both uh, here simultaneously forward and there you can see the disaster look how fast the needle moves luckily it is balanced because otherwise the imbalance would throw away the indicator here how fast the needle moves yeah uh, disaster um, the, the reason for this movement here is a twist in this surface here. Uh, the guide is lower on this side and higher on this side. And yeah, this twist is very difficult to shim. I tried to, to shim it here with some shim stock, very small sh uh, shim stock to 
uh, have a little bit fine adjustment when I place it near to the screw or farther away to adjust the tilt. But the 10 micrometer shim stock is just too thick to precisely shim that. You can clearly see when I start to shim that the, the needle on the indicator makes a big movement when I uh, move the, the carrier over that position. So yeah, shimming might be possible if you really have no other way to do it. But uh, I don't want to make any compromises here when I it's so much work to build this machine. So I really want to have it accurate in the end. So I cannot let it like that because uh, yeah, it's, it's impossible to let it like that because I think the, the linear ga guides will wear very fast. Well, let this this inaccuracy in there. Yeah, I hope I can show you a solution for the problem in the next video. I'm not really sure how I will do it in the end now, but I'm sure I will find a solution for that. Maybe it will take a little bit longer, but I won't give up. And yeah, I think that was really really enough talking for that video and i hope you liked it if you liked it please give it a th thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe if you want to stay updated about this uh, disaster here and yeah i hope i will see you in the next video goodbye